It's Tuesday, September the 21st, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast exploring social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Distinguished Policy Fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and I'm back in the moderator's chair this week. That means I get to introduce the stars of our show, three gentlemen we jokingly refer to as the Goodfellows. That would be Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, and John Cochran, Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. Gentlemen, good to have you back. Neil, thank you very much for doing the drudgery of moderating last week. Uh, I got a lot of emails suggesting why not more Neil, uh, maybe more HR, maybe more John in the moderator's chair too. What do you think, guys? I think you do too good of a job, Bill. So I'd I, I like to keep you in the seat. <laughs> uh, you sir, are a gentleman and a diplomat. <laughs> okay, so last week we uh, stayed in America's shores and we delved into California. Let us go overseas this week and talk about a series of uh, developments which I'd put under the uh, loose category of uh, changing of the guard. Uh, that would include earlier today, uh, Joe Biden giving his first address to the UN, President of the United States declaring that after a quote, a period of relentless war, it's now given way to what he called a quote, new era of relentless diplomacy. Uh, changing the guard is occurring in Germany this weekend. The good people of Germany going to the polls to choose a successor to Angela Merkel. Uh, what, does, what does this portend for Germany? Will it be an end to Germany's golden age? Emmanuel Macron does not face an election this weekend, but he faces one next April, perhaps against a rather divided right. We will see. In the meantime, President Macron is quite upset. He's recalled France's ambassadors to the US and the UK after those nations revealed that they intend to provide nuclear submarine technology to Australia. Uh, the question, is this just simply a case of wounded Gallic pride? Is it a reaction to France losing tens of billions of dollars, tens of billions of euros, excuse me, in submarine construction money? Or does Monsieur Macron not, be, not like being overshadowed by Boris Johnson on the world stage at an evolving game of Indo-Pacific geopolitics? Speaking and changing the guard, there's the question of NATO's future moving forward post-Afghanistan. Are we soon to witness a shift in the working relationship that has defined that institution for the past 70 years, the U.S. leading and our European allies following? Finally, if that's not enough, Europe looking at a very cold winter, a very limited supply of gas. What a great idea to have Vladimir Putin in charge of the gas supply of going to Europe. So, gentlemen, a lot for us to get into, typical of an American, I fear, are overpacked for this trip to Europe. But Neil, you were in Europe a couple of weeks ago. Why don't you tell us a little bit of what you saw on the ground and then go ahead and pick any of those half dozen or so topics that I just threw out at you? Well, Bill, I think one lesson of the last seven days is that, that you may talk about changing the guard, but the guard may not change. After all, we we were talking about Gavin Newsom's recall, but Gavin Newsom did not get uh, uh, overthrown. And Justin Trudeau ran an election in Canada, which had exactly the same result as the last one. Uh -huh. So my my sense is that the guards change less frequently than we might wish. Even in Germany, there's a scenario where they could have the election and not be able to form a coalition for months afterwards. Uh, so if you're expecting Angela Merkel to be kind of hightailing it out of the uh, chancellor's office uh, on Sunday evening, you'll, you'll be disappointed. She may have to stick around for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I, I came away from my European trip with the sense that there is, there's a greater stability in European politics than, than was true 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, we were just heading into the European leg of the financial crisis. That proved to be enormously disruptive. Uh, for a time, it seemed as if the single currency, the euro area would fall apart, Greece would leave, and then others would leave. And it's, it's not like that now. There aren't really any serious discussions, even on the populist right, about leaving uh, the eurozone I was in Italy uh, for a, a few days at, at a conference there, which brings together the, the Italian political business and, and media elite. And I've never seen Italian politics so stable. And that's because they've restored the monarchy. Admittedly, uh, they don't call Mario Draghi king, but in all, uh, to all intents and purposes, that's what he is, because uh, he's running the office of prime minister the way he used to run the office of president of the European Central Bank as an almighty uh, authority figure of whom everybody is a little afraid. And it's quite interesting the effect that this has had. All the Italian politicians who are usually a rather unruly lot uh, seemed almost like, like puppets in a puppet show giving their speeches. Draghi himself didn't show up at the conference. Uh, normally, 
the prime minister puts in an appearance, but he was too lofty to deign uh, to descend to to the land of mortals. So I I came away thinking Europe's stable, but then my days in Germany made me think maybe it's stagnant. Uh, you know, it's funny. Germany feels like over sixteen years. Uh, under Angela Merkel, nothing has changed. It's the same, exactly the same as it was 16 years ago. Even the election posters look essentially the same. The only thing that's noticeable is that the wonderful infrastructure they used to have looks a little bit long in the tooth now. The autobahns had lots of roadworks going on and diversion. Every time I took a trip in Germany, something went wrong. The trains were diverted. There were train strikes. I don't know. It all felt a bit down at heel, especially arriving there from Switzerland. So Europe's stable, but it's also kind of stagnant. And last observation, I think Americans don't care about Europe anymore. I mean, there was a time at the conference I mentioned in Italy when American senators would come. I remember John McCain would come each year and they would engage with their European counterparts and ask them big questions about geopolitics and the transatlantic relationship. And now I'm afraid the senators come I think mainly for the scenery and and the shopping. And there really wasn't a great deal of high level discussion going on. Conclusion, I think Americans have finally decided that Europe really is basically a high end vacation destination. And it's nice to be going back there after 18 months, but nobody really cares what the European leaders think. And that I think is what makes Emmanuel Macron so mad about the, uh, the new deal that's just been done between the US Australia and the UK. He feels, and he's right to feel it, as if he doesn't matter so much. And all his talk of European strategic autonomy is, I think, translates into American English as strategic irrelevance. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you, so you mentioned stagnation. Uh, And stagnation uh, means that things build up under, uh, things build up that eventually explode that you're ignoring. Uh, as an economist, I, I notice Europe with as, as kind of a tragedy. Um, Germany and France were almost at parity with the United States in terms of GDP per capita and have just slowly slipped behind us. Most Americans don't realize, or Europeans don't realize, GDP per capita in Europe is 40%, Northern Europe, the good part, the, the rich parts of Europe is 40% less than the United States. And we used to be about even. And every year that they have slower growth than us, we pick up another percentage. I mean, the US is no great free market nirvana, but we're picking up a percent or two on Europe every year. Uh, all the new companies you know, uh, are in the US. Europe doesn't have new companies anymore. The sort of genteel decay of, of a stagnant society, which, which doesn't uh, last forever. Europe is also shooting itself in the foot or, or turning off its lights uh, with its energy policies, uh, about to discover that the wind doesn't blow and the sun don't shine in Germany in the wintertime. Uh, uh, and, and I would like to, you, you mentioned everybody's all in for the European project, which, which I view as kind of a very sad to say, I, I'm a free trade economist and, and they passed the world's greatest free trade zone and nothing happened. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a slow one that you don't notice, doesn't lead to a crisis until people get tired of it. Uh, but are the Eastern Europeans still quite so happy uh, with this grand project? Does the average European voter know that they have already passed a Green Deal? They don't call it the Green New Deal, but it is exactly the Green New Deal the U.S. already passed and on its way uh, in Europe. Uh, and And as far as security arrangements, they do have a a Russia uh, on their uh, notorious eastern border that might uh, wake them up one of these days. So, you know, where do you see, do you see them just sort of slipping into irrelevant um, old age? <laughs> or do you, you know, where do you see potential things that may happen and change the stability and stasis? Well, three thoughts uh, in response to that, John. One is that although the, the the European Union uh, has a uh, a free trade uh, a regime for for goods. It doesn't have one for services, and and that's of course where uh, the innovation has been happening in the U.S. You know why are there no big European tech companies? Part of the answer is that in truth they're still national markets uh, that that you serve. Uh, even if it's digital services that that you're doing and and nothing really gets to scale for that reason. Second observation, it's a very different Europe the further east you go. My my trip took me to Hungary and then outside the EU's borders to Ukraine. 
And what is interesting when you get to Ukraine, which is, of course, where where the war is happening, where Russian troops are uh, on Ukrainian soil, it's a small war, but ongoing. Uh, what, what's striking there is that it's clear that the door is closed to Ukraine, both in terms of EU membership and in terms of NATO membership, even although those are the things that the Ukrainian government would very much like to have. Now, the Europeans give some very fancy explanations for why Ukraine can't join. You know, its rule of law isn't up to scratch. It's not ready to become part of the European Union. But when you look back at how easily Romania and Bulgaria were let in, it's a little hard to believe that these are the true reasons. And on close inspection, I think one very big reason why Brussels doesn't want Ukraine uh, to become a, an EU member is that it's worried it would be just as bad as Poland and Hungary uh, in its political, domestic political uh, trajectory if it joined. And what's happened in Poland and Hungary is that the populist governments uh, have, have come to power that the West Europeans find in various ways odious, uh, and uh, the West Europeans really don't want any more of those, thanks very much. Uh, so that, that's an extremely interesting uh, point to, to, to focus on. Ultimately, I think because of this, uh, this grey zone that now exists uh, between the EU and, and Russia, and this is where HR comes into the conversation, there's a very unresolved question. Uh, and and if, if Ukraine can't become part of the West, either in NATO or EU, well, what of the EU, well, then what does happen to it? I hadn't noticed until I was there that back in June, President Putin had delivered one of his occasional scholarly works, a very long historical article entitled on the, the fundamental uh, 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 union of the Ukrainian and Russian peoples. Long uh, argument for essentially bringing Ukraine back into the Russian fold. Now, if that's his ultimate objective, I'm not quite sure what there is to stop him doing that one day. Certainly, the Europeans without the US couldn't do it. And that's why all this talk of strategic autonomy, which we hear from President Macron and others, I find quite unconvincing because if strategic autonomy means anything, it must mean Europe's capacity to fight a war with Russia without American support. And I said to a number of European audiences, I think, let's face it, you'd last about as long as the former uh, Afghan government's army if it if you didn't have American support the way they suddenly didn't. Uh, so strategic autonomy, HR, this is really one for you feels to me like the kind of thing you put in a speech if you're running for re-election as the president of France, it's not actually a viable, it's not a viable option. It's not something Europe's prepared to pay for. And in that sense, it, it seems to me somewhat empty as a phrase. Yeah. And when we, you know, when we talk about the transatlantic relationship and, and our alliances, I mean, they're for a purpose. And I think that's often missing from the Biden administration's discussion of allies, right? Hey, we're back and it's gonna be a great relationship. Well, for what purpose? What, what are we oriented on? And, and of course, you've already mentioned the importance of deterring Russia, additional Russian aggression. I, I believe that Vladimir Putin is driven by a sense of honor lost and, and an associated drive to restore Russia to national greatness. And to do so really by dragging everybody else down, right? With a sustained campaign of political subversion uh, but then also by reestablishing Novo Russia, you see that already with you know the, the aggressive support for Lukashenko in in Belarus and the and the deployment of of Russian military capabilities there, also to threaten Ukraine from Belarus. Uh, but then also you you see this with the the uh, the deployment of forces around Ukraine, not only to coerce Ukraine, but I think also to communicate to the to the world that the Black Sea is a Russian lake, and and I, I think that. That, that that is aimed at intimidating NATO member countries, the two, two that you mentioned, uh, Bulgaria and Romania, who actually are pretty, quite strong, you know, NATO member countries who who meet their obligations in connection with investments and in, in defense and, and so forth. So, hey, what is the alliance transatlantic alliance for? Right, it's to deter Russia. It's to, I think to compete uh, and defend better against Russian new generation warfare and, and the various forms of subversion oriented on Europe and, and the United States. But then it's also to compete with China. And this is where there's such an important economic dimension, I think, to the relationship uh, in the area of, of technology, supply, ch supply chain resilience, um, and, and certain initiatives that Europe and the United States should be working on. 
So when it, when it, when Emmanuel Macron says strategic autonomy, he shoot himself in the foot. I think is your link to Neil, right? Because the, I mean, France can't compete with China without the United States, and the United States actually can compete effectively, certainly with China, uh, without without Europe. And I think what's unfortunate about the term, uh, you know, strategic autonomy is that it suggests a kind of moral equivalence as well, which I I personally find a little bit offensive. You know? So so I, I think that if our European allies are concerned uh, about the transatlantic relationship, I think they ought to they, they ought to uh, focus on on the actual competitions that where our interests align and, uh, and and to drop the language of strategic autonomy. So help help me out here. I'm, I'm going to play every man. Uh, first of all, um, I'm, I'm still appalled. You know, we and the Europeans gave Ukraine a formal guarantee of its territorial integrity in return for giving up nuclear weapons. So why does anyone take us seriously at all after that? I don't know. Uh, why is anyone deterring, uh, deterring Vladimir Putin? Uh, what is this strategic autonomy? Does, is this just a code word for China and Germany want to sell stuff to China? Uh, I'm sorry, that Germany and France want to sell stuff to China while we're busy having a Cold War with them? Is that it? Is that what we're talking about? I, I think what else so. are we talking about? That has, a, that has a lot to do with it, right? I mean, if you just think about at the same time that the, that that our government, the, the, the U.S. government, was declaring uh, that you know, uh, what's happening in Xinjiang a, a genocide, uh, G- Germany complete was a lead negotiator and completed the draft comprehensive agreement on investment. I think that's exactly what, what it is. And, and of course, it's not going to pass the European Parliament because of the other European countries that don't share Germany and France's agenda. And, and I think that, of course, some of our strongest allies in, in Europe these days are the ones that are sort of, uh, you know, on the outs uh, with, uh, you know, with, with Germany and, and, uh, and, and France. Poland in particular is a, is a very strong ally. And as I would say all of the countries that are represented in the Three Seas Conference uh, who are quite concerned about the, the issue that Bill brought up at the beginning, energy security and overdependence on Russia, such that Russia has coercive power uh, over the European economy. And, and, um, and this was a, b- a big mistake, I think, in, in connection with Nord Stream 2, which, you know, which was a corrupt deal, essentially with Gazprom and, and uh, you know, money paying off you know, former uh, German senior <laughs> officials and, 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 and the CDU. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and getting it done in a way that created this dependence. I mean, I think w- what the Biden administration should do is should accelerate the infrastructure necessary, you know, at Port Arthur and other places to export U.S. LNG as an alternative source for gas. And, and we ought to have a major project with, you know, with Europe to, to do that and, and to put the terminals in place in Europe uh, to, 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 uh, to access pipelines that break the dependence uh, on Russia. But of course, the Biden administration won't do that because they're ideologically opposed to all fossil fuels, even though natural gas is the, is the only really logical bridge from fossil fuels to, to renewables. Uh, and, and of course, Germany created this problem for itself, right? Uh, getting rid of all nuclear power uh, and then creating this dependence uh, on, on Russia with Nord Stream 2. I'm going to put my historian's hat on for a moment here and just tick up where uh, HR left off. In many ways, the debates that we're having are debates that date back to my childhood. That is to say, the debates about burden sharing in the transatlantic alliance are the same debates Henry Kissinger was writing about in the book he did in the 1960s, uh, The Troubled Partnership. The desire of a French president to have strategic autonomy, to be able to Uh, deal with Russia, deal with China without necessarily having to check in in Washington, that goes back to de Gaulle. And in many ways, what Macron has done has been to recast himself uh, as a a Gaullist figure, uh, a a real shift to the right compared with his first incarnation, uh, in response, I think, to a a shift to the right of, of French popular sentiment. And I think that's one way to understand what motivates the strategic autonomy line. It's it's really a good re-election line for somebody who wants to put on the mantle of Charles de Gaulle. Angela Merkel, who of course grew up uh, in what was then East Germany, uh, has always, I think, had a strange soft spot for Putin, which it's kind of fascinating to, to observe. I've never really understood why she has been so ready to make Germany reliant on on Russian natural gas. Uh, And I've never quite understood 
uh, why the CDU has followed her. I get why Gerhard Schröder believed in this because he was on the Gazprom board. Uh, but for German, I think, I think you've, got to, you've got to follow. You've got to follow campaign contributions to the CDU. I think that's a big part of the story, Neil. Well, See, that, just... that's a that's a, that's a that's an interesting point. I want to offer the thought that there's also something right there in the German electorate that wants to be uh, in a middle position. Uh, yeah. And if you look at the polling from last year, which uh, was, I thought, really remarkable, it showed that, that the German electorate wants essentially to be neutral in the event of a US-China conflict. It wants to be non-aligned. And I, you know, I would say that, that Germans actually want to be at the heart of a new non-aligned movement. Uh, if the world is is moving down the road to Cold War. Of course, President Biden went out of his way, speaking at the United Nations today, to say we don't want a, a new Cold War. But we're not seeking, say it again, we are not seeking a new Cold War or a world divided into rigid blocks. But I, I must say I find it striking that he felt the need to say that uh, because as far as his Chinese listeners were concerned, we're already quite well into one. John? Well, I would just add on, let me just add on the energy uh, question as, as an economist who follows the energy stuff. You know, even, even in our past, we understood that energy had a strategic consequence and fracking and the decline in natural gas prices, which happened entirely private, uh, no government subsidies there. Uh, produced a tremendous strategic advantage in that everybody we don't like in the world found that the prices of their exports were plummeting. And now we're undoing that. Um, you know, the Biden administration, the first thing it did was ban the Keystone Pipeline. No, uh, no fracking, no oil exploration on federal lands. There is, as you say, a determined effort to stop all fossil fuel production in the United States and then turn around and plead with OPEC to turn on the gas spigots, which was just hilarious uh, this winter. But as far as the security question, there's an old model, though, that uh, he who picks up the bill gets to place the order at a restaurant. That always struck me as a reason the U.S. shouldn't complain so much about burden sharing in Europe, because if they start paying the bill, then they get to decide what they want to do. But they still have this Russia problem. Is, isn't what they basically want to do is accept the fact that they are local, regional, not global of global interests, uh, would like to still make some money off of China while we do whatever we do in China. But they have this Russia problem. Uh, and, and it would seem like Europe would still want to take that somewhat seriously, don't you think? Well, I don't think you can underestimate what Neil brought up. And Neil, I don't know how much you've looked at the sort of the development of, of the, uh, you know, the, 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 I guess I would say the courting of the, of the intellectual left in, in, uh, in, in Germany, you know, by the Russians for, you know, for generations. Uh, but then also the more recent support for the nativist and far right parties. And I think what, what Russia has done effectively in, in Germany is, is to start sort of polarize uh, the the, uh, the electorate in in uh, uh, in Germany, and to do so in, in a way that diminishes German support for the transatlantic alliance and diminishes German will to confront you know an increasingly aggressive Vladimir Putin. Now it, it gets really hard to ignore though, right? When when you know when uh, Alexei Navalny you know, arrives in a German hospital after the attempted murder, you know using uh, using another you know uh, again a banned nerve agent. So. Uh, you know, I, I think that the events are going to continue to to spotlight the danger associated with uh, with Russian aggression. And but I just think Russia's done a pretty darn good job, you know, of of diminishing German will uh, to to confront Russia and deter Russia. My sense, HR, is that that they didn't need to push very hard against an open door. I I lived in Germany back in the 1980s and. Even then, there was a really striking amount of anti-American feeling on, on the German left. Uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, there was no great uh, sense of gratitude in the wake of German reunification uh, in the 1990s. Very quickly, by the time we got to the Bush administration, the, the anti-American sentiment was back. And I'd say it's almost always the case that if there's a Republican in the White House, there's a good deal of anti-American sentiment uh, in in Germany diminishes if they like the 
the, the cut of uh, Democratic president's jib, but it only really becomes latent. What's interesting, though, I think, has been the emergence of a far right in, in, in Germany, uh, which, of course, gets a great deal of its electoral strength from the former uh, Eastern lender. Uh, but I'm not sure how much any of that really needed uh, Russian financial support to happen. I think there's always been this sense, uh, which goes back way back in German history, that that really the, 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 that Germany shouldn't necessarily be rooted in in the Western uh, alliance structure or even uh, in in what we used to call Western civilization. I think that's an old old tension in German history that you can trace back to the 19th. Uh, century that was there in the debates in the early 1920s about where Germany should go after defeat in World War One, but it's a, it's of course not clear what's going to emerge from this election. And I, I have been observing German elections for a long time, and this is the one that's hardest to predict in certainly my my adult life. We we could end up with uh, a three party coalition, but which three? There is a scenario, though I think it's low probability that you end up with a, a, a coalition emerging under the Social Democrats, uh, the Greens, and the far left, uh, who essentially are former communists. That that would really give everybody a fright if that happened. Now I think it's a low probability outcome. We're more likely to get SPD Greens plus the Free Democrats. The old free market uh, liberals, that's the so-called traffic light coalition. And I could go on and on telling you about combinations of different German parties until we had almost no listeners left. But the, the bottom line is there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to emerge. And that's why I don't think we'll have a new German chancellor possibly for months after the election happens. Uh, and, and that is going to create, at least for a period of time, significant uncertainty about Germany's future political direction. Angela Merkel's single greatest failure has been to find a credible successor. And everybody who looked like they might be a successor somehow uh, had a political accident along the way. As a result, the CDU candidate, Armin Laschet, is deeply unimpressive and is highly unlikely to be the next chancellor. But what that means and who Olaf Scholz, the SPD leader, ends up governing with, nobody can really say. And a lot of Germans don't know either. I've never known such a large proportion of voters saying that they don't actually know how they're going to vote. And this is just days away. So let me uh, jump in here with two questions for you. Uh, first of all, in the great tradition of Churchill and Roosevelt and Reagan and Thatcher, Neil, we now have Joe and Boris. Uh, you have a column in the Daily Mail today in which you talk about the change in the special relationship. I'd like you to explain what has happened in terms of how the two countries view each other. And then HR, a question for you. It's pretty obvious that the Brits are with us when it comes to dealing in the Pacific. Before the submarine deal, they sent an aircraft carrier into the Pacific Ocean, sailed past China, sent through, uh, sent it to Korea. I think that's a pretty strong message. So something happens on that side of the world, it appears they're in. But who else is in? NATO is approaching its 72nd anniversary. How would you like to be tasked HR with the, ta uh, with the job of going to NATO allies and saying, we're going into Taiwan, fill in the blank, and we won't screw it up this time. You can trust us. We'll get out in a very orderly fashion. So, Neil, why don't you go first with special relationship, then HR, why don't you pick up with NATO? Well, odd couples uh, are a feature, uh, not a bug in, in global politics. And you wouldn't really have predicted much uh, chemistry between Boris Johnson and, and Joe Biden. In fact, there was a lot of pessimism at around the time that Biden was inaugurated, that he, with his uh, Irish-American background, would be pretty uh, anglophobic, would make trouble over the vexed question of Northern Ireland, and would regard Boris Johnson as, as essentially the old Etonian version of Trump. Uh, but to uh, the, the general surprise and astonishment of uh, commentators on both sides of the Atlantic, something very significant has just happened, uh, namely that the notion of post-Brexit global Britain, uh, which has been nothing much more than an empty phrase until now, has actually produced a result. Uh, I don't know whether we call it uh, Orsak or Orcas. I think Orcas is probably politer. The American, UK, uh, Australian uh, security uh, uh, alliance, which is essentially going to be a technology sharing deal with the Australians that will give them not only a nuclear submarines, but a good deal else, greatly enhancing their defense capability. That's That's been a big win uh, for Boris Johnson. Uh, it's, a, it's a more concrete 
uh, proof of the viability of a global Britain than anything that happened during the Trump presidency when they couldn't even get a, a free trade deal past first base. Uh, the polling that, that I was looking at when I was writing that piece for the Mail is quite fascinating uh, because it looks as if Americans are more into the special relationship with the UK than the Brits are. But as I point out in the piece, this, this poll was done after the fall of Kabul and before the announcement of the Australian uh, UK US uh, deal. So I think it's something of a temporary aberration. The truth is there is a special relationship there. It's remarkably durable despite the vagaries of, of politics on the two sides of the Atlantic and the personalities of presidents. And I think it's rather heartening to find uh, that there is a way that the UK can play a distinctive role uh, in the new geopolitics of containing China. And, and of course, Monsieur Macron hates it, uh, but I think it's often the case that you can judge any initiative by who hates it. If the French hate it and the Chinese hate it, I mean, I'm predisposed to think it's probably good. You know, I'll, I'll just say what, I, what I'm detecting, Bill, is, is uh, among, among our uh, European friends initially was anger, disappointment uh, about, uh, about the, 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 uh, the, the surrender to the Taliban and, 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 the, and the, you know, the, the disastrous uh, withdrawal and during which we left their citizens. Uh, behind as well as our, our own citizens. But now I think that's shifting to concern. I think there's grave concern that that America has lost its confidence uh, and, 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 and its, its will. And, and of course, the world becomes a much more dangerous place if that's the case. I mean, I think if you just take a quick survey of what has occurred since the disaster in, in, in began, it was the ongoing disaster in Afghanistan, you had uh, Kim Jong-un you know, spun up the Yongbyon plant and tested some missiles. You had uh, Iran uh, greatly expand uh, its its enrichment of uranium uh, and accelerate its its nuclear program. You had you know you had uh, more aggression by, by by China, who actually announced their intention to patrol Taiwanese airspace, really take it under their control, and and then violated their airspace. Um, you know, with about ten fighter aircraft. Uh, you know, Russia has has maintained its its sort of aggressive stance toward Europe and, and is clearly using the course of power of energy supplies by, you know, by denying your know, request to, to increase uh, stockage before, you know, before the winter. And so, so the world is becoming a more dangerous place, I think, because of this equation of, of deterrence being capability times will and the belief that our will has gotten down to close to zero. And, and there are a number of, of European leaders I, I know are, are going to try to, to strengthen the transatlantic relationship. So we may have kind of a positive reaction to this as well. And, and we mentioned that there aren't the same kind of uh, you know, the same uh, leaders in the U.S. who who prioritize the transatlantic relationship, like like the late John McCain, for example. But I will point out that Bill Haggerty, who who's a senator from Tennessee, who, by the way, I think the world of as a person and, a, and, and a, just a dedicated uh, uh, public servant, who was a great ambassador to Japan uh, when I was national security advisor, he, he went to he went to the UK and went to Europe, uh, went to visit NATO just to, to, to compensate really for this catastrophe in Afghanistan and to affirm, you know, our, our commitment and our commitment to the to the alliance and, and to the transatlantic relationship. So, I mean, I, you know, of course, I, I'm playing true to form as the optimist here, but I do. But I do think, you know, at some point you got to hit bottom and I just hope we hit bottom and we're on an upward trajectory. But let me just ask short questions of both of you. So you know, HR, you said. It's 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 will as well as the ability, but and, and if we're at a bottom of will, I, the whole point seems to be that Europe is in even less position to have any will, especially uh, regarding China. Uh, Neil, um, what happened to Brexit? Uh, isn't that I thought when you went to Europe, all you talk about is Brexit? Are we just so over? Uh, does this mean the opening of the Anglosphere? The idea that the U.S., U.K., uh, Australia, and maybe someday Canada and New Zealand would get together. And, and form some sort of club that, that means something. Uh, either of you, you want to explain what the heck is up with this sub deal, which makes no sense whatsoever. Why I, I gather it's some sort of diplomatic uh, thing that the French are, are angry about. And last, Joe Biden's UN speech needs commentary from, from both of you. I gather that our new strategic plan is that we have armies of, of, uh, of we have big communiques ready to go anytime we're unhappy and, and armies of diplomats ready to respond with really stern communication should anything happen. But perhaps that's an unfair, uh, that's an unfair reading of, of where US is going. John, let, let me start with, with Brexit. 
the, the debate about Brexit over in Britain, and oddly enough, I think it was it was finished by vaccines. The way in which uh, earlier this year, the European Commission tried to get in the way of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was deeply alienating to people, including many who'd voted to remain uh, in the EU. At the same time, the success of uh, the British development and deployment of the vaccine seemed to suggest after a a pretty bad 2020 when the UK had not handled COVID well, that after all, uh, Britain could do things competently. And I, I think that that means that the debate within Britain about Brexit is over. Of course, the, the divorce goes on. I mean, as divorces do, and the costs of Brexit are not trivial. But I think Britain's now in a situation a bit like Switzerland, in which it finds itself quite proudly out of the EU, uh, at dealing with the EU on a kind of non-stop, ongoing basis, uh, but not really discussing any longer whether it, it made a terrible whether it made a terrible mistake. Yeah, John, John, your question about the UN General Assembly and President Biden's speech and and you're extolling the, the great virtues of, of America's invigorated dip, diplomatic efforts. Yeah, I just got to say, I think it rings kind of hollow, right? Because unless diplomacy is backed up by action, right? And 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 oftentimes, you know, by, by military capability, it, you, you can't really accomplish much because guess what? A lot of our, you know, a lot of the world, our, our rivals, our adversaries, our enemies, they're not just waiting around. You know, to cooperate with us diplomatically. In fact, they're, they're adversaries who are trying to undermine our, our efforts. And you know, I've, I've quoted uh, the late uh, George Schultz, our, our wonderful colleague and, and long public servant and, and leader, before on this issue. Right? He, he said that you know that that negotiation is is a euphemism for capitulation, unless the shadow of power is cast across the bargaining table. And so the real test, I think, for you know for strategic competence, is the ability to integrate all elements of national power with efforts of like-minded partners to, to accomplish goals and objectives, right, for a purpose. And, th- and that includes you know, diplomacy with military capabilities, but obviously with economic policy. I mean, we should point out, hey, the Biden administration canceled a Canadian pipeline and greenlighted a Russian one. I mean, and 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 so I, I think that the, 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 the disconnect between what we're trying to achieve uh, diplomatically and and the impl- the the the, uh, the application of other uh, other uh, elements of power I think is striking and you know I, I I think that there are those in the in the administration who use this mantra all the time right our policy has become you know too militarized right so the military has to take a step back hey well how about just getting the diplomats to take a step forward I think it's worth pointing out that in Afghanistan after the Benghazi uh, attacks uh, attack on our, on our embassy and when we lost our ambassador, the State Department pulled back all of our consulates in Afghanistan to a Kabul bubble, and we and we disengaged politically from you know from Herat, uh, from 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 uh, Kandahar, from Mazar Sharif, and what if instead of a diplomatic effort to to supplicate to and make concessions to the Taliban, we had actually tried to strengthen the internal you know political commitment in Afghanistan, commitment to a non-Taliban future? I mean that would have been maybe a diplomatic uh, effort. That would have contributed to uh, you know, averting this catastrophe that we see in Afghanistan. So I, anyway, I just think whenever I hear more and more and more diplomacy, I just think, how about improving our strategic competence and integrating elements of power? But I think what both of you have said, which which uh, is a good lesson for me, is is I think what Neil said is that we need to talk to our friends. Uh, that's part of diplomacy, rather than surprise them in the middle of the night with things that they don't like. Uh, and I think what you're telling us is you also should listen to your enemies. Uh, yes, you're not going to diplomacy isn't going to be a substitute for power. But if you under, if we understood what people wanted a little bit better, we might be able to craft things that aren't just uh, that aren't that don't come from a cacophony of misunderstanding quite as much as we seem to do. Right, and and and, and make us prone, make us prone to these cognitive traps of optimism bias, confirmation bias, and mirror imaging. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we actually said it. I mean, our leaders have said that we are going to partner with the Taliban against jihadist terrorists. How crazy is that? It's, it's completely, it's delusional. I'm sorry, Neil. I was going to say that one of the most interesting features of the, the landscape uh, today is the tendency uh, for, as we were saying earlier, the Europeans to feel that China's too big to mess with. Uh, and we've just had a good illustration of that 
when little Lithuania, uh, of course, a former Soviet Republic, now a member of both the NATO and the EU, uh, got on the wrong side of Beijing for having some dealings with Taiwan, which of course is uh, one of those things you're not supposed to do. And uh, it's actually striking how feeble the collective European response has been to the usual Chinese bullying uh, of Lithuania over this issue. And there's a pattern of this. Uh, the, the, the Czech Republic, I think, was the last uh, the last country in Beijing sites. The Swedes had their period uh, of being uh, out of favor in, in Beijing. And the Chinese have figured out that they can lean on individual EU member states and they don't get terribly much pushback uh, from Brussels. Now, I, my observation is that there are certain key countries, I think Italy in particular, as well as Germany and France, that just feel their economic interests with respect to trade with China are too important uh, to, to risk. Uh, and that's why the EU seems, if not non-aligned, then at least pretty feeble uh, with respect to China. But there's an irony here, because as we speak, China is perhaps in the early stages of its very own made in China financial crisis. Uh, the name Evergrande probably wasn't known to a great many uh, good fellows uh, viewers until Monday when global stock markets sold off because of the possible default of one of China's biggest property development companies. John, this is right up your street. Uh, I'm asking myself, is it the Lehman Brothers moment? I know it's not because China's not a market economy. But still, this seems like a pretty big size default that's coming down the pike. And China's a pretty big economy, number two in the world by most measure. What, what are you thinking as you, as you read the reports of, uh, of this Chinese financial crisis? Well, I was hoping I get to ask the questions and, and you would get to answer this. As, you're the economist. I, Come on. Yeah, but you're the guy who knows what's going on in China. <laughs> uh, you know, we, you read stuff coming out of China. The numbers are all just amazing. Um, you know, the volume of construction uh, that has gone on, uh, you know, they put up buildings at, at you know, 100 times. I don't know the numbers, but just the rate at which buildings were going up relative to construction in the United States is just, just a, a enormous. Uh, yes, there's this huge amount of uh, empty property, property building build up, uh, a huge amount of debt. Uh, the interesting thing, as far as I can tell, is that the Chinese government is willing to let this happen. Uh, you know, there has not been defaults in China, but they don't really have a bankruptcy system. Um, and, and the government has not let defaults happen because so many people have put their savings into property. So they understand they don't like social unrest. And if, uh, you know, if, if people have put their savings into property and the property values go down, you have a lot of social unrest. China, remember, doesn't have much of a social security system, doesn't have much of a pension system. Most people don't have many children. So the, the savings rates are just outrageous and a lot of outrageous, they're very large and a lot of it has gone into property. So, uh, you know, keeping up property values and making sure that all of this castle of, of debt, castle of cards of debt uh, keeps going has been a major part of their policy. So the news, I think, is not so much that there is a bankruptcy that the government is willing to let a bankruptcy happen. Now, I put it in, in the category of them cracking down on the billionaires. Uh, they are doing, um, they seem to be, be following very much the Sanders-Warren uh, policy. They have realized that uh, billionaires start to want political power and voice, and we're going to get rid of the billionaires and make sure that uh, they toe the party line. Uh, part of this fascinating idea to get rid of, uh, um, to get rid of uh, prep courses uh, basically, you're going you're gonna to get ahead through the party, not through making money is sort of what I see uh, China moving to. Now, will it all work? It is the, there is kind of a house of cards aspect to this whole thing. Um, you know, where, where do you see a financial crisis or a, a brewing? Well, you need a, an enormous amount of debt, horrible accounting, uh, poor bankruptcy procedures, and usually the government uh, propping it all up. So Chinese property has long seemed to me like a, a place to look. Uh, and sovereign debt to be the next one. So, uh, you know, China will, will undoubtedly try to keep things propped up, but they are trying to uh, deflate, uh, especially, uh, you know, rich people who make too much noise. And, uh, you know, when you buy stocks in China, you're not buying ownership of Chinese companies. You're buying some convoluted contract run through Hong Kong that sort of promises you to pay something, but you don't have an ownership right in Chinese companies. So I certainly could see a, a big, well, I've been waiting for a long time 
you know, it's sort of like waiting for earthquakes in California. It's coming sooner or later that that uh, whole Chinese fi obscure financial mess uh, unravels a little bit. And I'll just say, we'll see if this is the time. Hey, can, I, can I ask you guys a question uh, for, for Neil and John both? And when are U.S. investors going to kind of wake up to the geostrategic risk associated with with China? I mean, wh when are they going to stop being long on totalitarianism? Like, I just I just think of the timing of this with BlackRock coming out with their big fund, you know, buying up a lot of Evergrande debt right before you know, right before it lost half its value. Didn't Lenin like, say that the capitalism it's time to end hang capitalism? The capital. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they'll sell you the news. In fact, you're not even getting Chinese stocks when you buy these. No, stocks. we're actually financing their purpose, their purchase of the rope, so they can hang us. So I, I mean, when does this, when does this shift? When does the market begin to correct in a way that acknowledges uh, the, 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 you know, the, the geostrategic and regulatory risk uh, that that you run by doing business in China or investing in Chinese companies? Well, the, the scale of the inflows uh, from the rest of the world over the last 15 months is just extraordinary. We're, we're talking about foreign investors, including uh, to a large extent US investors and in putting $527 billion, that's over half a trillion dollars into Chinese stocks and bonds. And what wakes people up HR in the financial world is losing money. And the people who put these trades on over the last year and a half are staring uh, at some really ugly red ink at this point, because you as John need, mentioned, another example, right? I mean, so many of these companies. Well, the tech, the tech. Interesting thing here is that the first real move by the Communist Party against the financial elite, the business elite, was against the tech companies, starting with Jack Ma uh, and uh, Alibaba and Ant Group, and and really that was a that was last year. That was the signal of a real change in the fall of 2020. Uh, there, there have been a succession of explicit statements by the party of a new line uh, on the basic issues of, uh, of, of social equality. Uh, and I think uh, in that sense, allowing Evergrande to go bust is, is just the latest in a succession of steps, suggesting a really big shift in the party line on the economy. Now, I don't think this is surprising because I think Xi Jinping has signaled for some years that he actually takes Marxism, Leninism seriously. And Xi Jinping thought is full of the old Marxist Leninist doctrine. Uh, but from the vantage point of Western investors, this is the nightmare scenario. You, you put your money into China thinking that it was a capitalist economy. And lo and behold, it turns out to be a communist one and, and goodbye to quite a big chunk of the money. And let's be clear that perhaps as here, the, the rhetoric of, of inequality is, is not the reality. There, there is still going to be social inequality, just you're going to get it through the party, uh, not through uh, getting, getting money. So it's really about, about power in that sense. You know, the, the mechanisms of capitalism and freedom were on their way, and, and uh, they really don't want that. Those are going to be cut short. But coming back to Europe, you can see why the Europeans got themselves into this bind the German automobile manufacturers became heavily reliant on the Chinese market. The Italian and French luxury goods companies would have been in deep trouble over the last 18 months if it hadn't been uh, for China's insatiable demand uh, for European brands. Uh, and so one can see why, as the US and China began uh, really going back to 2017, when you were in government HR, began to be engaged in a, a, a strategic competition, to put it mildly, for the Europeans, this was uncomfortable. And I, I, I don't find it surprising to give an example that the attitudes towards China in Italy have scarcely changed over the last four years, whereas in other parts of the world, they've become distinctly more negative. In Italy, there hasn't been a shift. And when I was in Italy, I was very struck by the fact that the Italians do not want to talk Cold War. Uh, they'll have been relieved by Joe Biden's speech today. They really do not want this to escalate uh, because from their vantage point, uh, if you take away Chinese demand, uh, it's not quite clear where the substitute is. It's certainly not going to be the US or the rest of Europe. Well, guys, we're winding down here. So why don't we uh, end the show now and let's end it in Neil Ferguson fashion with a lightning round of questions, which John Cochran hates, but Neil loves. And John, <laughs> I'm going to go with you first. Here's the question for the three of you to uh, ponder. Since we've talked about Europe, it's a two-part question. I'm going to point you to Europe and I want to ask you the following. Number one, name the country you would like to live in Europe in terms of your lifestyle. 
But then secondly, the country in Europe you'd like to live in in terms of good government and stable political leadership. John Cocker, and I assume you want to go somewhere where there's good wind so you can fly your glider. Well, let, me, let, me, let me go third on this. <laughs> HR, want to have a crack? HR, okay, well, you know, I, 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 so, I, I, HR, you. HR is. I, mean, I, I lived, I lived in Europe for, for gosh, eight, eight and a half years. You know, so, so I, I love Germany, uh, I, and and uh, I just, I love the the way that, uh, you know, the towns are organized, uh, the hiking possibilities around all the towns. I do love the beer. I have to say. Um, and, you know, as a rugby player, you know, I, I love living in, in, in the UK. I mean, I love living outside of London. And um, and so, I mean, I, I love both those countries and we enjoyed living there and traveling all through Europe while we were while we were, were there. Uh, the best place, the best place to govern. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, maybe Norway, you know, because they and they're pretty they're pretty financial, pretty much financially secure. Uh, as well, thanks to their their sovereign wealth fund and and uh, and the money they made from from gas and oil. Uh, but that's that's a great a great country to to live in. I love the Norwegian people. They're they're kind of a hardy, tough people based on the elements, and and uh, and and uh, they have a, they have a small but but uh, tough little army there too. So anyway, I I, I mean I I love all of Europe, um, and uh, and I would go back to live there again. I mean I enjoy Europe. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to give Neil because Neil will always have a good one to clean it up with. <laughs> okay, John, where would you like to be, and where would you where should you live? I assume you want to go someplace where there's a lot of wind. Uh, well, I uh, I spent a lot of my childhood in Italy and uh, absolutely love the place. I love all of Europe. It's 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 a wonderful place to be, but I have to be in the uh, the hills outside of my uh, adopted hometown of Florence. Uh, as far as governance, though, not so great. Sorry, uh, Miyamichi. Mm. Uh, I, I admire Switzerland and the Nordic countries. Uh, they pay attention to incentives in a way, they're very hard nosed about incentives in a way that we don't. Even their vaunted social uh, safety net um, uh, doesn't, doesn't just hand out money without thinking about it. There's, there's good governance. They're very high on the ease of doing business index. Yeah, they have, they have high taxes, but they're very well run. Okay, and Neil, do you go back to the ancestral homeland or where would you set up shop and where should you set up shop? I'm with uh, John on Italy, who can resist it? And uh, having just uh, celebrated our 10th anniversary on the shores of Lake Como, I, I know I, I can't give a different answer because my wife would overrule me if I didn't say Italy. But if you're, if you're selecting for governance, it's fascinating that my colleagues have picked non-EU countries uh, in every case. Uh, we've had the UK, we've had, had Norway and Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland certainly impresses me because of its extraordinary decentralization. It's the only modern state in the world that has preserved the kind of decentralization that the United States was supposed to have hardwired into it by the constitution. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing we should be doing, it's learning from Switzerland how to be decentralized again. Uh, but no, I'd have to pick the UK. If I'm allowed a non-EU option, I think one of the things that made me cheer when the Australian US UK deal was announced was that it was a validation uh, of Britain's continuing strategic relevance. I've been a little unsure about the aircraft carrier. Would it make it? Would they run out of fuel? No. Britain is still a serious player, not least in the worlds of, of military capability and intelligence. And I love London. Indeed, I love the whole of the UK, even the recalcitrant Celtic periphery. Uh, so yeah, I think Italy for the holidays and, uh, and Great Britain for the residents. Okay, good answer, okay. Neil. Good answer all. Is that uh, very, very clever on your part. And uh, by all means, when you all move to Italy or wherever HR is going, by the way, very cold water in Norway, uh, HR, that's going to cramp your uh, paddle boarding style. Oh, the fjords are much warmer. They're much warmer than you think the fjords. When I went to Norway, I was having been hardened in the Scottish Atlantic. I was expecting cold water. It's like the Mediterranean by comparison with Scottish swimming. Well put. Okay, gentlemen, well, that's going to be a wrap on this week's episode. Uh, great conversation as always, but fear not, folks, we'll be back next week with a new topic and a new conversation. On behalf of my Hoover colleagues, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, John Cochran, and all of us here at the Hoover Institution, we wish you and yours the very best. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.